if you have a, a Bible with you, the paper kind or the kind on your phone, uh, we've been looking for the last couple of weeks at uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, just walking through a bit at a time because there's a bunch in there. So if you, uh, if you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 7, if not, you can just listen. Um, think about this just for a second. Have you ever thought about how much information comes across you in a week? <laughs> think about how much information that just kind of comes with, you know, across your, your face, your ears within the course of a week. So some of you watch the news or listen to the news, right? There's some people have TVs and listen to the news, computers, phones, all that kind of stuff. The amount of podcasts people send me is unreal. Um, my mother listens to seven preachers every Sunday. Um, there's presidents and people who are against the president, information from there. There's social media of all forms. There's blogs. There's those group texts you get trapped in for the rest of your life. Lots of information on those. You can't get out because it says you left the conversation and people think you hate them. There's the nosy neighbor. I mean, there's information nonstop that, that we think about. And pause for a second and think about this. Your grandparents, your grandparents had just a small percentage of the information that you get. We, and by the way, this is a whole other sermon. We have the same ability to process information. Like we can't process it any better than my great, great grandfather. But I, I would say we have so much more information that we have to sift through just on a daily basis. So in this last year and a half alone, think of the things you've researched that you never thought you'd research. Pandemics and masks and what in the world is a PPP loan? And then what is a cryptocurrency? And what is a keto diet? Things on race, all kinds of social issues. And guess what I found and that you found when you research it? You find that one person who's exactly right, everyone else is wrong. So you find 19 different opinions on the same thing. And it says everyone else who thinks differently is wrong. And you sift through all this information. And then what happens? You're exhausted. You're absolutely exhausted because all you're trying to figure out is something about a pandemic or an issue. And, and you sift through all this information and it's mind numbing and soul numbing. So here's my question for, for followers of Christ. How do we honestly know what's true and what's false? And the thing I'm gonna keep saying today, which is kind of at the center of where I think this message goes, as Jesus followers, all information needs filtration, okay? Put that in your memory. All information needs filtration. By the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put myself in here. You should filter every sermon I give. Because sometimes it's dangerous. You'll, as a pastor, you talk to people, and it's like some people, you can tell them to paint themselves purple, and it's like, oh, I guess I'll go do that. No, 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 no. Filter everything I say. We're going to get more into this. And I kind of think that we have this filter that we filter all the information we get. It's like an incoming filter. And then there's this other filter that's supposed to filter the things that come out of our mouth. I feel like when God built me, he didn't give me one of those, but um, I need one of those. And my question is this, though. How do you process your information? Have you ever thought about, with all the information you get, as a Christian, how do you process that? Do you have like a plan for how you process information? So let me give you a little context. This is the end, getting to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I'll end this next week, chapter 7. is some uh, tons of uh, ethical issues. But what Jesus ends a sermon with, which people, pastors today, you can't end a sermon this way, you get in trouble, but he ends with three warnings that are just kind of in your face, no wiggle room, kind of coming in with all the heat. And one of them is, one, the first warning, I'm not going to do this today, but one, the first warning talks about the wide path, the narrow path, the wide gate, the narrow gate. And all that's essentially saying is the way of Jesus is the narrow path and the narrow gate. Like we're called to follow the way of Jesus and less people will do that. And the wide gate just says that it's kind of this floating down the river and we just kind of go with how the culture goes. That's the wide gate. Uh, that's the wide path. So that's the first warning. But then the second warning, which is something in the, the way the churches I was raised in, um, the thing we did not talk about, and certain flavors of churches talk about this all the time, but the next warning has to do with false prophets, false teachers. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at today. And I actually think it's probably more applicable than you might think uh, as we go forward today. Um, so Matthew 7, starting at verse 15, false teachers, true teachers, false disciples, true disciples. So listen to this, verse 15 through 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. 
By their fruit, you will recognize them. Remember that line. By their fruit, you'll recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And this whole fruit thing is all through the Gospels. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear bad, uh, good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their, meaning false prophets, the teachers, the spiritual leaders, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Okay, so when I say false prophets, what comes into your mind? For me, I, do you remember David Koresh, the Branch Davidians, Waco, Texas? Like, that's kind of where my brain goes, like, ooh, that's maybe what Jesus is talking about. And then for me, in the era that I w was raised, there was a lot of the televangelists and a lot of the um, scandals of televangelists that would have all this money and hoard all this power on the backs of vulnerable people. And I think, oh, that's probably what a false prophet looks like. Power, control, manipulate the sheep. But here's what Jesus is saying, and this is really interesting. He's actually saying false prophets are hard to spot. Because sometimes we think about like, oh, that has to be a false prophet. But he's actually saying false prophets are hard to spot because remember he says they're going to look like lambs they're going to look like the people of god the children of god and and in the greek it's, it translates pseudo prophets which basically means false prophets are the ones that are saying some true things but mixed in there or they're hiding behind a little bit of truth with stuff that's not true so let me give you an example which is crazy that i actually have an example of this, but I do. And it was in this very city 20 years ago, there was a bunch of us who were young Christian leaders. And there were some folks who were associated at UNCW. There was a, a very well-known campus ministry that I was actually involved in across the country, the world. And some people from there were uh, having meetings in their house and teaching. And there's a lot of stuff that was gospel stuff. It was good Jesus stuff. But long story short, it ended up to be destructive false teaching. And in this community, there were 60-some people wrapped up in it, split families in half, um, divided churches. I mean, stuff went to the courts that deemed it a cult. I mean, it was on and on. And I lost one of my dear friends for seven years. We didn't say a word. Today, I talk to him every single week. But I lost for seven years through this thing. And by the way, these people that were doing destructive false teaching they just look normal. I think sometimes we think you have a long beard and, you know, walk around with some kind of glowy bulb in your hand, you know, and all this. No, no, no. It was just normal. That's a donkey, by the way. Every Sunday, baby, without fail. So this is what Jesus is saying. You know, the warning in this text, he's saying, keep your eyes peeled because they actually just kind of look normal. And here's where it gets very convicting. False prophets, teachers, influencers, leaders are inside the church. A quote I read this week was, there's more harm, and this is convicting, there's more harm done inside the church by termites than the woodpeckers on the outside. There's more harm done on the inside by termites than woodpeckers on the outside. So let me back up for a second. You think, is this just the only time we hear about false prophets in the Bible? If you've read scripture from Old Testament and New Testament, it shows up a lot, but we don't know how to talk about it today because we don't know how, it's, how it fits in to, to 2020 or 2021. Are we in 2020, 2021? So for instance, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy talks a bunch about false prophets. Ezekiel and Jeremiah give these warnings where they specifically say, don't listen to those prophets, they're lying. Uh, New Testament, Peter says this, there will be false prophets in your faith community. That's a promise. There will be false prophets in the church. And then remember, in the Gospels, there were the legalists and there were the Gnostics that were tainting the message, the gospel of Jesus. They were kind of getting in there and tainting what Jesus was trying to say. And then this is one I would love for you to pause on for a second. When I reminded myself of this text, it's powerful. So Paul is saying this to Timothy, to a young church leader, and he says this, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, right? They will not put up with godly teaching. Instead, to suit their own desires, and I'm not looking at you all. I'm thinking about how I can fall into this. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths, what is not true. Okay, so... Human tendency is to have itchy ears. 
I love that phrase that, that you see, itchy ears. And so here's what happens. If you watch, people will go to the pastor that will tell them what they want to hear, the therapist that will tell them they, what they want to hear, the friend who tells them what they want to hear, the philosophy or the belief that tells them what they want to hear. And it is true of conservatives and uh, progressives and religious and the unreligious. Basically, we find our person that tells us what we want to hear. That person or that idea or set of books or thinkers or whatever become our prophet. And then here's what's dangerous. We don't filter them because we just love what they say. Okay, so I'm going to say this once again. What does information need? Filtration. Um, I get texts all the time when people be reading something or podcast. Hey, Nate, what do you think about this church, this preacher, this whatever? Now, I can help you filter. We're supposed to filter kind of in community, but you're called to filter too. So what does scripture say about spiritual discernment? About So here are five filters. If you want to think about them, write them down, do whatever you want. But here's how people filter out false teaching throughout scripture. The first one is wait it out. That's what the Old Testament people did. They just waited it out. So if you said something questionable to me, you come spoke, you spoke something over my life and say, okay, we'll just wait her out and see if this is really true. Um, I don't know if y'all, do y'all remember Harold Camping? Harold Camping was this guy that got made a lot of money by predicting the second coming of Christ. Okay, scripture, by the way, says that we're not to predict the time of the hour, but this guy made a lot of cash. And he was wrong and wrong and wrong about the second coming of Christ. So people are just kind of like, okay, Harold says Jesus come back again. Wait her out. Let's see if Harold's wrong. And he was. And he died. And I remember taking a a group of people to uh, students to Jamaica. And there's an evening program where they brought a preacher from Kingston, Jamaica, came in. And he called a girl out of our group. Really preppy girl. She, She went to Cape Fear Academy. She's a friend of mine to this day. I remember standing up there nervous as all get out. And this guy started for a long time prophesying over her. And then he called the two guys behind her because she was going to fall out in the spirit and fall back and catch her and all this stuff. And this girl was smiling so hard because she was sweating bullets. She was raised in a little Presbyterian church that didn't do things like that. So I'm not saying there's not prophecy and people speaking that way. I'm just saying she was so confused because this guy was speaking as if he was the mouth of God. And you had a 16-year-old going, uh, what do I do with all that? And when we gathered together that night, I remember the conversation we had. And there's this great scene in Acts chapter 5 where Peter and the disciples are before the Sanhedrin. And one of the Pharisees named Gamaliel stood up. And listen to this. It's so helpful. This is what he said. He said, wait, back off on, on these boys real quick. If what they're saying, the disciples, is of humans, it's not going to do anything. It's going to fail. But if what they are saying is of God, Gamaliel says, you can't get in the way. You can't stop it. And so that's what we, when we hear things, we can think if it's of man, if it's of God, it's, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Um, and here's a, a quicker method, though. So that could wait it out is a long one. But Jesus actually in this section says, here's a second filter, and it's by fruit. He talks all about fruit. What is fruit? Verse 16. It's, it's character. So when people are saying things, when we're learning, and that's why it's hard when you listen to podcasts and books and all that stuff, you're not really sure of the character of the person who's saying it. But the word here, which is really helpful, is congruence. When you think, and this is convicting, Will talking about confession, does my inside match my outside and my outside match my inside? That's congruence. We're called to live congruent lives. I remember when you talk about fruit, my mom would, would say that when churches were looking for a new pastor and we're doing like a search, she said, if we could just skip all these interviews and all this stuff, and if I could just go live in the pastor's house for a week, I'll tell you if they're a good fit. I'm like, that's a little creepy, mom. You can't go do that. But do you see what she's getting at? She's saying, like, does the inside match the outside? Do you see why, as a pastor, that this sermon might be hard to preach? It's convicting for anyone who plays any leadership role in the church. It's a convicting thing to preach from. And here's the deal. You all know, sitting in this church today, this outdoor church, the damage of hypocrisy. How many times have you heard the story of this super religious parent or aunt or whatever that crushed people with their faith? That, that, that it didn't line up, that they were at church all the time, but the way it was in the home didn't line up. Uh, that's 
congruence. That's the damage of hypocrisy. And my question to me is, is my outside aligned with my inside? What I'm saying to you today, does it line up with what's on the inside? And here's the truth as the pastor of this church. Not always. Not always. That if you are my wife or my kids, you know, if you can say this to any pastor or preacher. Sometimes our spouses are out there going, oh, God, if they only knew what kind of knucklehead he was last night. And so that's why we have a prayer of confession, because just like anyone else, my outside cannot match my inside. OK, I'm going to keep moving forward in these next couple verses that are warnings that are really actually hard to hear, but they have filters. So I'm going through these filters. Filter number three. And whatever you're listening to or the person that's talking to you or whatever you're reading, when, is their agenda Jesus or is it something else? So verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. A true disciple does God's will. And here's what we need to hear on this part. Many people like false prophets all throughout scripture speak Christianese. Right. So, I mean, I wasn't following Jesus, but with my dad being a pastor, I could throw so much scripture and every creed and I could convince you that I knew what I was doing. But doing God's will is so much more than just knowing some scripture. It's 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 our actions. Right. And so I think the question is, do we or does the person we're listening to have an agenda that's different than God's. It's not just God's agenda. And what will, if you listen, that sometimes people's agenda is their country, their nation, their political party, race, or any, any kind of thing that could divide, that becomes more important than God. And so is their agenda God? Okay, here's a fourth filter. Does a person have an authentic relationship? Do we have an authentic relationship with Christ? Verse 22, this gets, I mean, he's cranking up the heat here at the end of this sermon. Many will say to me on that day, that's judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly. So just so you catch this, they're saying, we did a lot of great ministry, Jesus. And Jesus says to them, I didn't know you. Like, I never knew you. And then he says, away from me, you evildoers. So Jesus is saying, you did great things, but I actually didn't know you. And this word no is really interesting. So uh, there's a lot of cheesy pastor jokes that have to do with this word no. But the word no, uh, gnosko, is the word in Greek. But it's, it's this, it's intimate, meaning that if you think about, um, it says Mary and Joseph, they didn't gnosko, they didn't know, they didn't consummate their marriage before Jesus was born. So it's that intimate to talk about no. But, but he's saying, I didn't know you. Like I didn't walk with you and talk with you. I didn't hear from you. You just kind of did your own thing is what Jesus is saying. And then the fifth and final one is, is what we just read. But the final filter is God. God is the ultimate filter judgment. We've, we've read about sheep and goats. Um, and that's God's role, not ours. So you should be really grateful that God didn't ask you to be a judge. That is what God does. So here are a couple of final thoughts as I think, think about this, this passage that most pastors wouldn't be super excited to preach. And it was kind of hard, like, oh, my gosh, here's where we go this week. One, one, one thing, Jesus is simply just saying, keep your eyes peeled for false teaching. People, things, whatever information you get, keep your eyes peeled. He is not saying go on a witch hunt. Now, every single Christian leader has some kind of obscure little website that someone has posted against them calling them a false prophet. Everyone's a false prophet. According, I mean, there are certain denominations and groups of people that like everybody's a false prophet. Um, that's not true. So, you, I mean, you can go out and search my life and do a witch hunt on Nate Stratman and, and you'll find that I'm a sinner. But um, I don't think you need to do a witch hunt on our family or anything like that. We just need to peel your eyes, right, to, to be aware. But here's the big one I want to encourage us as Hope Community to do. Would you take time, more time, to test your resources your sources of information. So I don't care what news network you look at or whatever it is, it needs a filter. I don't care what the information is. There's nothing out there, by the way, that's filterless. So 1 John 4, 1, this has always been helpful. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And here's how I think about it, because I think sometimes even the people I trust the most, I've taken their information blindly. Oh, I trust you. It must be right. But 
you're still not God, whoever is giving me the information. So I think about colanders. Like in our kitchen, we have a bunch of colanders or strainers. And what are those colanders or those filters? Well, for, for Christians, it's always been God's word. We, we've got to know God's word and what God's word says. But it's been prayer as a colander. It's been the Holy Spirit. It's been we get together in community. If people are rolling solo and have all these prophecies of what God says, but they're out there on their own, that's a real warning flag that we process this stuff in groups of people in, in community. And here's a great question that you can just, as I, as I wrap up, here's a great question to think about. Does this teaching, whatever you're listening to that's, that could inform your faith, does this teaching push me to pursue the will of God? Or does it explain things in just the way that I can do whatever I want? And I've had to think about that a lot. Ooh, I like this person's teaching because they're basically saying, you do you, Bubba, roll with it. I'm like, that's awesome. That's not the gospel, but that's what I wanted to hear. There is a tendency, what I would call Jesus plus theology where like a cling on, right? That there's the faith and we kind of throw these things on it. And if you look back, there's all these fads and trends over the years that cling on to the Christian faith. It's actually called syncretism. Um, so Dante's Inferno has done a bunch of things and shaped scripture, Da Vinci Code, Left Behind series, self-help books, legalism, consumerism, all these things cling on to the gospel in some way. And a lot of those things I just mentioned aren't evil, but they skew Christ's message. They need a filter. Um, so if you think right now, and I love this kind of stuff, what shapes our culture right now? So I read a lot on this kind of stuff. But right now, I'd say the primary shapers of our culture would be higher education. Um, entertainment would probably be the big two, like the entertainment, and, and maybe the government. And there was a point when the church was a primary shaper of culture. I don't believe that we are in those days anymore. But higher education, entertainment, and government. So here's three responses you could have to information. You could take more of a kind of a fundamental approach and say, whatever the information is, we're going to shut it all out. So anything that comes from the arts or the sciences or whatever, it's bad. On the other side, there seems to be a, a more a progressive approach, which is just let it all in. It, it's all good. So I don't think you can hear Jesus saying that either, saying it's all good. So is there a third way? And the third way, I believe, is the filter. It's the Jesus lens. It's the gospel lens. Like to actually find a third way to not just shut everything out and not just say everything is good is so challenging to do and holy. And here's what, when people are willing to do the third way, to jump in and say, we don't just call all these things bad and we don't call all these things good, but we enter in and have a, a dialogue. When the people of God who see things a little bit differently, ethical issues are willing to do that, it's rich. It makes us better. It's not to win or dumb someone down. It's, it's that, that we actually, that's rich stuff that happens if people are willing to explore this third way. So I want to land kind of with this. This is what I've been saying the whole time. Faithful followers filter frequently. Now that's the cheesiest thing I've said today. I just kind of wiggled when I said it. But it's true. Faithful followers filter frequently. Oh gosh, that's cheesy. I can't keep saying that, but it's good. But here's what I want you to think about. And this is really important. We desperately need prophets to help us follow Christ. We've been talking about false prophets. We actually need prophet prophets. And what do I mean by prophets? Again, some of us think it's like, I don't know, Lord of the Rings looking long beard and all this. No, 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 no. A prophet is simply this, a guide, a luminary, someone who's shining a light on God's will. And there are prophets all in our church. These are guides. These people are everyday, faithful, ordinary men and women who listen to God and shine a light on a path for others. So if you think about it, our world is complicated and overwhelmed with information, and we have to have, church, we have to have godly guides to help us walk the narrow path and find the narrow gate. And it is on that path that we taste and see the goodness of and grace of God. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we, we admit that um, sometimes we think we don't need a filter because we know what's right in every area of our lives. God, we actually ask that you'd humble us, that we'd be willing to filter all the information we have, 
so that we can live lives that not only honor you, but lead us loving our neighbors in a sacrificial and gracious way. God, help us live this way and convict us of those things that could come across or that could actually be hypocritical and cause pain. May we live in a way that's honoring to you, Lord Jesus, and we need your help. We pray this in your name and all God's people said, amen.